L is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone could love, adore, and love is all that I can give to you. Love is more than just a game for two. Two in love can make it. Take my heart and please don't break it. Love was made for me and you. Now there's a Mother's Day gift that there is no refund on and I apologize for that one. But, but what the Nat King Cole classic song really helps us to contemplate is how do you spell love? And how do you define love for that matter? Nat King Cole gives some thoughts and some, some imagery towards that. And that's what we want to talk about today. How do you spell love and how do you define love according to God's word together? And of course, that iconic love passage in scripture is 1 Corinthians 13, where love is spelled out and defined in the sight of God and in God's word. And that's what we want to contemplate today. As we touched down last week and want to dwell on further this week, 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to hear it with the echoes of Mother's Day in mind. It's, it's Mother's Day. And loving and honoring mothers is prime in the, the, the context of which we approach this text today. That's a good thing. Love also, we've probably heard the 1 Corinthians passage in many weddings that we come to. I, I would say every other wedding that we have in this church uses 1 Corinthians 13 as a part of that wedding ceremony as a reading is done on that lines. And so we've heard the imagery or, or the love connotation between spouses and a husband and wife in that way. I, I want to remind you and encourage you that 1 Corinthians 13 was primarily written for church relationships. It, it wasn't written to spouses. It, it wasn't written to mothers in Mother's Day. It was written to a church in Corinth about living in love. And it was a church in Corinth that wasn't without its problems, right? We covered some of those last week and some of the church troubles. We've been covering it for the last really three months together, some church dynamics that were at play. And yet in that context, Paul is reminding them that the Christian journey and the Christian maturity is about growing, defining, and living in that love that, that is accessed from a God who loves us, that pours us to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, yes, 1 Corinthians 13 applies to mothers and Mother's Day. Yes, 1 Corinthians 13 applies to spouses in a marriage relationship. But, but yes, in an exclamatory yes, 1 Corinthians 13 was originally applied for the church of God. And so we want to hear that with that in mind. What does love defined by God, and lived out amongst God's people look like. And so if you take, as you've done each and every week, your, your Bibles at your house, and open up with me today to 1 Corinthians 13. That's the passage that we're going to walk through together. I just think it would be he helpful for you to have 1 Corinthians 13 opened right before you. We're actually going to pick up at the very end of chapter 12 in verse 31. It's the lead-in for, for, for 1 Corinthians 13, and it reads this in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. We're talking about excellence today. Think back to, to those grade school years when a teacher would stamp on your paper, you know, maybe a sticker that says excellent on it. And, and, and just the, the, the joy that I might have brought you there. I mean, I have just a whole closet filled with those papers with those excellent stickers still slapped on them from kindergarten, first grade, second grade. You, you know I'm lying to you right here, right? Maybe had one of them, but that's what we're talking about here today. Excellence. And, and what does excellent look like defined by a God? What, what kind of sticker would God slap on a life that he's saying that's, that's excellent? And it's an excellence that's associated with love, as we're going to find out says this, I will show you the most excellent way, verse 1 of chapter 13. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
We talked about what tongues were a little bit last week there. Notice it's mentioned yet again, tongues of men or of angels. There seems to be two different kinds of tongues spoken. The tongues of men is being able to speak in different languages to proclaim the message of Christ. We see that taking place in Acts chapter 2 of Scripture. This supernatural ability to speak in a language one doesn't know, but to communicate in a foreign language to someone who that is their native language, the message of Christ. That's the tongues of men, but also the tongues of angels. It's, it's this heavenly language that Paul's addressing in chapter 12 through 14 of this book, whereby we're, we're given this angelic language to, to, to really pray in an intimate walk with God there. Two kinds of tongues expressed, and yet the bottom line of this, if we're doing this, if, if we have this heightened experience with our walk with God, and yet have not love, we're, we're just making a lot of noise, right? Paul's word, a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. For those of you that aren't musical like myself, I proved that in just singing a moment ago. A resounding gong, clanging cymbal, that's hardly music. It's, it's just making a bunch of noise. And, and maybe those of you that have a, a child in, in band just starting out, you know what I'm talking about, right? Just making a lot of noise, but, but not the music to it. If, if, if our walk with God is all about having these religious experiences all about like speaking in tongues or some angelic encounter in that way, and yet it's not applying out in a love of neighbor. Paul says, God says that we've missed the point of it. We're just making a lot of noise, but we're not really making the music that God has designed for us to make in our walk with God and our walk with people. This, this religious journey of following Jesus isn't just about a religious experience. It's about learning how to love God and love people. Anything other than that is just a resounding gong. A clanging symbol. He's got more to say along those lines. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. Once again, prophecy, a gift that's dropped that Paul has been talking about that we mentioned last week in chapters 12 through 14. Prophecy, if you would jump ahead to chapter 14, 3, it says what prophecy is all about there, about the strengthening, encouraging, and comforting of others. It's expounding on mysteries, as he said right here in this verse. It's knowledge. It, it's like being able to memorize the Bible front and back. Having God's Word just in your being in that way. And yet Paul says, if, even if we can have Scripture memorized front and back, even if we can tell all mysteries of faith, like how God created this world, or why is there suffering or evil happening, even if we can expound on all those mysteries and have such knowledge but lack love, then Paul says, I am nothing. Once again, we've, we've missed the point. I, I think it was Descartes that said, I think, therefore I am. God would say, I love Therefore, I am in some ways. It's not thinking. It's not head knowledge. It's not just knowing these mysteries front and back that makes us someone. It's loving and and applying that out, that love in that way. He's not done yet. Verse number three. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. This maybe is the most confusing one, right? Because we like to think of generosity, of, of giving gifts to the poor, helping those in need in that way, that, that those are loving acts. And yet, as we've said in this place before, sometimes we can do the right action with the wrong motive. Like sometimes we can do the right end result with the wrong beginning result. And, and Paul really saying that we've gained nothing in that transaction because God's about transforming the inside, not just the outside. Let, let me illustrate in that way. So, Sometimes we can give big gifts simply because we want the tax write-offs, not because we really care about those that we're given to. Sometimes, right, politicians are known for kissing babies, not because they really care for the kid, right, but because they know the camera is catching this move and there's votes on the line for them, and so they'll look caring on the outside when really they could care less about the kid that they're kissing. I'll, I'll give a personal one. Sometimes I'll read my kids a story at night, 
And it's, it's really not because I care about their, their development or reading helping the mind in that way. Sometimes it's just because my knees hurt from wrestling on the floor or I'm tired of being that jumping gym and jungle gym inside the house there. And so I'll say, kids, I'll talk them into reading a book instead of wrestling on the ground there. Why? Because the knees hurt in that way. See, see, sometimes we can do the right outer thing. And if you walk through the door of the house, you'd think, man, that Justin, he's a pretty good dad. And really it's, oh, I just don't want to be jumped on tonight in that way. You, you, you catching that? Sometimes we can miss the, we, sometimes we can miss the beginning for the end in that way. And, and Paul's trying to say here through God's word that love needs to be the motivator, both internally and externally, for, for us to be something and to that life of excellence that God is really getting at there. I, I, I just want to be clear. It's not that these things are bad. A religious experience, like speaking in tongues, that's not a bad thing. Prophecy, knowing God's word, speaking God's word, comforting others in God's word, that, that's not a bad thing, right? Giving to the poor, being able to endure suffering with courage, these are not bad things. And yet what Paul is trying to highlight is, is don't miss the beginning things that make these things in the purest outworking of things. Yes, we, we should crave religious experiences and know more about God's word and do good to people, but we need to make sure the motive is right, not just the a- final action. See, God's concerned with our affections, not just our actions. He wants to transform us literally from the inside out, not just put makeup on the outside to fool others in the process. And that's the transforming work that ultimately only Jesus can do. And so how do we know? If we're living and growing and maturing in this love walk with God, well, well, they're going to define. God's word is going to divine, spell out how a Christian spells love in this next passage. I just want to read it through quickly just so that you can get the flow of it. And then we're going to step back and go word by word to kind of see what this says. God's word reads this, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I want you to take a moment, we're going to reflect in, in a little bit here. But I want you to take a moment to read through that and to think through each and every one of those words for a moment. What, what does love really look like in the sight of a God who is love in that way? Take a moment to reflect on that. And then following that, some other reflections to, to do. What are some stories or instances where you can remember God's love on display? And I'll give you a hint. Just leaf through the Gospels. Look through the life of Jesus Jesus is the picture of the principle of what God's love looks like lived out in the real world. Jesus shows us what real love looks like in the real world that we wake up to each and every day. And so think of some stories and some instances where God's love is on display, even in difficult days and difficult situations that Jesus has to come across. Take some time to reflect on that as a family or around the table or call up a friend or just think through that. And lastly... What is a situation or a scenario that you're struggling with now? And how does the Bible's definition of love speak to that scenario? Do one of these words of love just jump off the page and apply directly to a scenario or a struggle that you're going with? Read through this, think through this, and wrestle with those reflection questions for a few moments. Hopefully you took some time to reflect on that love passage. I just want to read through it one more time, offer just a little picture there, and then continue to move on from there. But, but verse 4, love is patient. That means love takes time, right? Love can't be rushed. Love is patient. Love is kind. It means it's nice. It's respectful. It's aware of its tone and doesn't slam doors in that way. Love is kind. It does not envy. 
It, it doesn't want what someone else has. It's, it's, not, it, it's not proud, but it's, it's grateful for what one's given and not just greedy about getting what another has. It, it doesn't boast. It is not proudful. In other words, it's, it's not focused on self, but, but there's a humble aspect of love that genuinely wants to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It's not inwardly focused, but outwardly focused in that way. Keeps going. It does not dishonor others. It honors others there. Like Mother's Day, honoring others and encouraging others in that way. Love is not self-seeking. Once again, not inwardly bent. It's outwardly thinking. It's not easily angered. It, it doesn't mean that love never gets angry, but it's that or anger isn't an immediate arousal, isn't the knee-jerk reaction in that kind of a way. It keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, love doesn't keep score. It's not into record keeping in that way. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. There's a true aspect of love. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a sensation. It's grounded in what is truth. And so to really love is to really know what is truth and how do we apply that to these situations. It keeps going. It keeps no record wrong. It delights in truth. Verse 7 Love always protects. Love knows that there's some enemies that threaten love. And so there's this sheltering, this protecting imagery of love. Love trusts. There's this faith, there's this belief aspect connected to love. Love hopes. That means that love has a future, right? Love's looking forward and moving forward in that way. Love perseveres. It's a step-by-step, day-by-day, one step in front of the other kind of a perseverance in moving forward. Love never fails. That means that love has a victory story, right? And being caught up in this larger imagery of love in that way, it's a good thing. And it's a thing to imply. That's how Scripture defines and declares love. We, We live in a world that wants to define love in many different ways, right? Hollywood has its own version of love and what love looks like. Human nature has a version of love and what it looks like. A contract, you know, you please me, I'll please you kind of a a mentality. You scratch my back, I'll deal with you fairly then. If you don't deal with me fairly, then I'm not dealing with you fairly. God's word defines love in this way of being patient and kind and long-suffering and moving forward. Sounds good, right? But how in the world can that apply to, to my life, right? I think that's where the struggle meets the road. I would wholeheartedly agree with the Bible's definition of love, and yet where the rubber meets the road is love is patient. Then what do I do when I'm not patient, right? What do I do when the kids are jumping on the back or or a kid talks back to me and I'm about to fly off the handle and go silverback gorilla on them? Love is patient, and yet you get thrust in these situations where you're trying your patience, right? Or love is kind, then why is it so easy to to fling back a sarcastic comment to my wife when it should be kindness that permeates that relationship, right? I I agree with the definition of love, and yet the day in, day out is a struggle to love in this way. And so what's the secret, and where does true love come from? Well, I think Paul's getting to that in the next section where this is growing up, a maturing process, which we'll get into. But even before we get there, we need to be aware of the word that Paul uses for love. It's, It's agape. The Greeks have four different words for love to communicate different kinds of relationships. You got just simply the natural compassion or bond that you might feel for a complete stranger. That's storge kind of love. You've got the romantic love that's on display between a husband and wife. That's eros in Greek kind of love. You got brotherly love, the kind of love that you have just among friends. That's phila. We get Philadelphia from that Greek word of phila kind of love. But the word that Paul uses here for the love is that fourth and highest form of love, agape. And it's a God love. It's it's a love that comes from above. It's a love that originates ultimately only in God. And I I think we get the thrust of that in 1 John chapter 4, where Paul drops... What is agape love and how agape love transforms into our life? Let me just read it for you for a moment. 1 John chapter 4, picking up in verse 7, says this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. 
How do we love patient? How do we love kindly? How do we love not keeping score and truthfully in all these ways that 1 Corinthians 13 calls us? Well, in order to get connected to that love, we've got to get connected to that God who is love. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And, and I would add everyone that truly loves, right? We can put on the appearance or the facade of love, like those illustrations we used a moment ago, right? Of kissing babies but not really caring for the baby, just doing it for their care of self. That, that's not true love there. That's just the facade. That's just the makeup, the outer exterior of love. How do we get in tune with this love that's inward out? That's a motive, not just an action. That love ultimately comes only from the transforming work of God on a life. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He's the source of it. Not love is God, but God is love. He is the source of this agape love pouring into his people. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Love is on display through Jesus. We see a picture of love, and right? A picture is worth a thousand words. We see the picture of what love looks like in real life through the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. The source of agape love is God pouring into our life a picture display of Jesus' love for us that launches out to love one another in this kind of a way. Will we do this perfectly? No. As a matter of fact, the lead-up to 1 John chapter 4 is 1 John chapter 1 that says if we claim to be without sin, we're lying. But if we do have sin, we're to confess our sin to God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is saying you're going to mess up in this love sometimes. But turn back to me. Confess it, own up to it, and turn back to me and allow me to pour my life through you. I I think maybe an illustration could be helpful. It's trite. It's generic there, but all I could think of in this pouring of God's love was a pitcher and a vessel here. If, if God is love, if he is the source of love, he's the pitcher. And it's way more infinite than what this picture can display in this way. But we're the vessel, right? And what God wants to do in our life is to pour into us. Pour from above his love. Transform our life from the inside out and pour so much through us, right? That we are overflowing in love towards others. Now, now we can change that process, right? We can cut ourselves off from God's love pouring into us and just tip the cup so that there's no way for God to do it. That, that's what sin does in our life, right? It cuts us off from God allowing himself to pour into us. And what we need to do in those instances is to turn our attention back heavenward. God, I've messed up. God, I've tripped up. God, I want to be your vessel for this world and for this witness. And God just keeps pouring. He is more gracious, more patient, more loving than we realize and that we give him credit for in that way. And so praise God that God is love, the source of love that pours his love that flows into a world where vessels are ready and waiting to receive him by faith. If, if that's a picture, if that's an illustration, this past week I found myself at the funeral of Jim McKenzie. Many of you know Jim, connected to Mike and Jackie Beck's. And as a part of that funeral, I heard one of the grandsons of Jim share some family stories and and just remembrance of who Grandpa was. And it was an illustration that spoke to me about love. This grandson of Jim remembers and recalls a day when Grandpa took him to an Akron Rubber Ducks game. And there was an encounter after the game with with someone who seemed to be in a rough spot. And and, and the, the grandson just remembers how Jim reacted to that. Jim just loved the guy. He, he, he just took time with them. He listened to his story and helped me to need in, in, in that moment. But what the grandson said in reflecting on that is what most got to me. The grandson said something along the lines of, how do you love a complete stranger like that? I, I, I'm not sure I know how to love, but grandpa knew how to love in that kind of way. And it was just telling to me 
of, of Christian love on display and grandpa's witness in that, that the grandson was contemplating in the wake of his death. How do you love a complete stranger like that? He was unsure himself, but he knew grandpa knew, and grandpa put that on display in a searing image that really spoke to that grandson, even young in life in that way. And I think Jim's secret was no secret, really. As, as, as he was laid to rest in his casket, he was wearing a cross. He had a picture that had Jesus loves you written all over the cross that was in the casket with him, too. It was no secret. How Grandpa learned how to love was that he received the love of Jesus that just made him overflow in the love even of complete strangers they met after a baseball game and the way to their car in that way. It, it's a Christian picture. And, and as I'd say, it's, it, it's, not, it's not an instant fix. It's not meant to be easier than what it's sounding in this way. But it is a lifestyle of just posturing ourselves to let God's love pour in us and to pour through us because he's got more love than even this being can handle. It's got to be expressed outwards to a love of neighbor as well. And like I said, that's a process. Love is patient. means love takes time. It's a process of growing and maturing in that way. And I think that's what Paul gets at in his closing comments in 1 Corinthians 13. He goes through the maturation process of love. He says in verse number 8, Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. I like these illustrations he throws in next of childhood and of mirrors in this way. In verse 11, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I, 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 I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, <clears throat> I put the ways of childhood behind me. I, I, I like that imagery in that way. I, when I was a child, I was afraid of what was lurking underneath the bed. Maybe you were too. <laughs> I will tell you with supreme conviction, last night I went to bed and I didn't even look to see what was underneath my bed. I could just shut my eyes and sleep peacefully. I was not afraid of the monster lurking underneath. I put that childish way behind me when I became a man and got my own bed in my own house in that way. You catching me? There's some progression and some journey that we're to live into as it relates to love too and how we learn and lean into love as God continues to pour that love through me. He gets another illustration of a mirror right here in verse 13. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Mirrors in the ancient world you need to know was polished metal. It wasn't like our bathroom mirrors that we might associate with today. It was polished metal, so it's more like looking into a spoon. Try, try doing that. And the distorted image that you might get in that kind of a way and compared to the face to face the clarity of a face-to-face -face conversation rather than a mirrored conversation talking into a spoon. It, it's Paul getting at that there's a clarity, there, there's a growing up, and there's a realization that what we're looking into in this side of eternity is like looking into a mirror, like looking into a spoon, like we are children on this side of eternity. There's more in store and more that we have to look into and to lean into. We're not going to get this love thing purposely down here. And yet continually we're to polish that metal and to grow up like children into manhood and know what it looks like to receive and to give this love of God that continually pours into our life. It's the adventure of all of eternity and it starts in the here and now that Paul is trying to impress to this church in Corinth. He closes in this way, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We could trace out principles or sing another song in, the, in that kind of a way about what love is. But I think what we most really need to do in passages like these isn't to wrap our minds around it, right? Knowledge is in part. And knowledge isn't the end game. The end game is how to apply that into love. And so principles won't do, songs won't do in this instance, in this way. What I think we need to do is, is to put our vessel facing upward and to just allow God to pour into our life and our walk in love. And so we want to do that through a closing prayer together where we're just going to pray about love. 
And I invite you, there's going to be some pauses in this prayer time. It's going to be a little bit lengthier of a prayer. There'll be some pauses, and I just want to invite you to pray through some areas that maybe you're struggling to love, or how does love look like applied out to this difficult situation. Just tip your glass to allow God's infinite love to pour into that situation. And that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a quick fix. The first words, love is patient. It it takes time. And there's some struggle in that process. But as we turn our cup towards Him and allow ourselves to receive the love He has and overflow in others, it's the direction God most wants His people to live in. God is love. He's given that expression of love through His Son. And we're called to love others in the name of that same Son. For God so loved the world, right? For the heart of our gospel truth is a God who loves that pours into, opens us, and ignites us to what love looks like in real life. And so let's close with some attitudes of prayer together. Let's just pray together with love in mind. And I'm going to read a passage in Ephesians for us together that really highlights love, and then we're going to pray about different aspects of love with Mother's Day in mind and different things that we're going through as a church and as a nation in mind too. And so we just want to pray for love in these contexts together. And so let's be in an attitude of prayer. At the end of this prayer, we're going to pause. I invite you in that time to just pray. Love into your life or love into situations that you're wrestling with, that you just need God's guidance and how to love best in those situations. And so let's be in an attitude of prayer together. Dear Lord, I would pray over your people the words found in your word of Ephesians 3. Paul said to the church in Ephesus, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, Lord, root your people and establish your people in love. May they have the power, together with all God's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Lord, if we've never experienced that height, that width, that depth, that breadth of the love of Christ, Lord, may today be that day. May you just flood into our life, flood into our cup, flood into our being, Lord. How much that you truly have loved us that would propel you to go to the cross for us. Lord, thank you for that love of Christ. And help us to live in the assurance of that love of Christ. Lord, I would pray that that to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God in this love. Lord, I pray for your fullness. I pray for your maturity. I pray for your growth in this love amongst your people. Lord, do that for us, we pray. Even as we contemplate what love looks like in 1 Corinthians 13, may you just pour that love into our life and through this life to love others in the love of Christ. Lord, I would pray a special love upon mothers today. It is Mother's Day. And Lord, I I pray for today those longing mothers. Those that Mother's Day just kind of twinges us the wrong way. It's, It's hard. Because Mother's Day reminds us maybe of miscarriages or of waiting for a man that that never came or tears that may be shed as we just have dreamed of a different day that has not been. Lord, I just pray for those mothers today that just are struggling with this. I'm thinking of your, 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 your woman in Scripture named Anna who had a husband early in life, who died early in life, and the rest of her life was as a widow. And yet, Lord, in Scripture, she wasn't known for her tears but for her cheers because she literally beheld Jesus in some way, even in the midst of that loss. And we celebrate her still thousands of years later for that. Lord, I would just pray that we would behold Jesus, even in the midst of our loss at points, Lord, that we would behold Jesus and that he would, we would find our significance in him, in that Christ child, in a way that no other child could satisfy or would satisfy, even if we had a whole house full of them. Lord, just meet us in that loving moment and love us through Jesus for longing mothers. Lord, I would pray for those young mothers, the many that make up this church in those impressionable ages that they have of their kids. Lord, I I, I pray for, for those days that feel long and those years that feel short. Give us wisdom and help us to make the moment of these days that you have given us with our kids. Lord, help us with these little sponges to truly soak them and saturate them 
and a life of significance, a, a life of spiritual depth, a life that will go on to echo into eternity. And help show us, Lord, how to make decisions in these everyday moments, Lord, that really are going to set them up for success, not only in this life, but, Lord, for eternal life. I just pray for the young mothers of this church, Lord, that you would give them strength and courage and wherewithal to take the steps in that direction with these days being long and these years being short in mind. Lord, I would pray for adult mothers. Many of those mothers may be feeling the crunch today. Maybe they're caring for aging mothers or, or fathers, and maybe they have care of, of kids that have flown the nest in that way and yet still very much are dependent in some way upon mom and dad. I, I would just pray for those adult mothers in mind. Lord, help them in the midst of their setting to navigate some end-of-life issues with their parents and how to set up their kids to be successful apart from the everydayness of, of their mothering under their influence. Lord, just, just give us a unique and needed wisdom for this new season of life that our aging mothers are in, Lord, and help us to navigate this terrain. Help us to love in the midst of that setting. Lord, I pray for love for your church. 1 Corinthians 13 was written predominantly for your church in mind, Lord. And so I just pray for your church and that you would teach us and help us to define love according to your word and how to apply love rightly in the midst of that context. Lord, one thing that is often in the context of your church, predominantly here in the West and here in America, is how do we navigate lovingly this issue of human sexuality? I know the Methodist Church is debating that and, and, and deciding that in a general conference upcoming in this way. And Lord, there's this aspect of love that love is kind. And there's a camp that wants to trumpet it, that aspect that love is kind. And then, the Lord, the, your word tells us that love is truth. And there's a camp that wants to trumpet and just camp out in that love is truth. And yet the reality of it is that love is both kind and truthful. And that we're called to live in this paradox of kindness and truthfulness, even as it relates to human sexuality. And Lord, those lines aren't easily drawn. And so I just pray for your help as a church as we try to navigate these waters and to live as a witness in the midst of this issue. Lord, help us, help lead us, help love through us with this issue. And Lord, it's not just an issue for the church. It's an issue for, for, for parents, some who have children, Lord, it's an issue for siblings, some who have a brother or sister with this in mind. Lord, it's, it's not just a headline issue. It really is a home issue, a heart issue, an everyday issue. And we just need your help in how to love through this issue that rightly witnesses who you are and what you're up to in these lives. Lord, I'd pray for the headline issue that, that really just came into fruition this week and the events down in Georgia that took place back in February. I'm talking about Ahmaud Arbery. Lord, it's just a reminder once again that, that there is hatred, that there is racism, that there is bigotry. There is the opposite of love. That is a reality news story, headline story, not just a news story, personal story that many wake up to each and every day. Lord, I would just pray for love in these aspects and justice in these aspects. And Lord, it touches on so many hotbed issues too, Lord. It's going to turn into a political thing. It's going to turn into all these different headline news. And yet the reality is, is this is a love issue. How do we love people, Lord, across races, across classes, across economic divides, across all these lines? Lord, how do we love people? And help us as a church, Lord. Help me as a white pastor. And what role do we play in all of this, Lord? What does love look like reaching out to these issues? Help us to be love in the midst of real tragedy. And Lord, I would just pray for our Barry's mother too. First Mother's Day without her son coming home from a jog in that way. And just the grief that she must feel and sense beyond words that a white pastor can express but not beyond where a loving God truly can touch a life. And so I would just pray for your love to be unleashed in this situation and real lives really impacted by, by the horror of these events and these headline news. Lord, there's a million and one other ways that we need love both personally and politically and as a nation and as a world in that way. 
And so, Lord, for the remainder of these moments, we just want to soak and sit in prayer and allow your love to pour into our life. And so let us pray.